it's time for FNPS After Hours. FNPS After Hours. FNPS After Hours. FNPS After Hours. Thanks for joining us for tonight's edition of After Hours. FNPS After Hours. And gets Hello, everyone. Red Welcome to... Red Skin. Red Skin. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the FMPS After Hours. We haven't had an After Hours since last October. Oh, sorry. Um, but now I'm very happy that uh, we are reintroducing the program and we have Dr. Lauren Anderson there live and in person with Lily Anderson Messick. Lily Anderson Messick. So, you know, we have the Anderson party, Valerie Anderson. <laughs> we have just had an extensive conversation about we're all not directly related, um, which is, <laughs> you know, unfortunate. <laughs> <laughs> but um, before we get started, I have just a few announcements. So you have a twofer this week. We have this after hours on Monday. And then on Friday, we have um, uh, freshwater shorelines planting with native plants with Tia Silvesi of Orange County Extension. And so that's Friday at noon, as always. Um, and then, of course, please don't forget your Florida native license plate is uh, voucher presales are on, please go to fnps.org and then the voucher button is right in the, in the center there for you to go get one. And this can really help us with, um, um, we, with our conservation programs and other, um, other you know, society needs. So please consider purchasing a camo style voucher. All right, without further ado, take it away, Lily. Hello, um, I'm Lily Anderson Messick, and I'm here today with Dr. Lauren Anderson. I and I'm I'm not going to talk very long. I'm just going <laughs> to let you introduce yourself and say I'm really excited to have you here today. Well, thank you. It's fun to be here. You had asked how I got interested in botany. I guess I got it legitimately. My father uh, got his PhD in plant sciences. He was a breeder of peas and beans and was instrumental in some of the very important uh, uh, selections that were used in World War II when they introduced fast freezing, you know, so that the GIs could have uh, fresher food out in the field. So fre fresh frozen peas and beans, some of them discolored when they were frozen and he uh, hybridized and bred them so that they would maintain their color when they were frozen, but he also bred them for uh, drought resistance or earliness or disease resistance, whatever. So he uh, <clears throat> was a plant scientist, but he was an avid outdoorsman, loved to go fishing. So uh, the love of the outdoors and love of plants got from my dad. I'm number three of five boys. And so my oldest brother and dad would uh, look at pressed wildflowers a Sunday afternoon after church while mom was resting. She had to rest with my boys, I'm sure. But uh, I kept thinking I wanted to get in and they said, you're too young. But when I was 11, my elbows were big enough and I squeezed in between them. And so from 11 on, I was learning plant names. Wow. The uh, textbook I had had no illustrations. It was just all technical descriptions written by pure uh, Rydberg, uh, written uh, 20 or 30 years before I was born. And so I learned the names that were, uh, part of them were in what we called the American Code. So it wasn't the International Code of Botanical Nomenclature. So some of the generic names changed. But when I got to college, I knew these old generic names and the professor would laugh. He says, well, that went out of use years before you were born. Yeah. But I learned... Uh, that, but then uh, the public library, they didn't have any good illustrated books from the Western United States. I was born and raised in Idaho, but uh, at the public library, they had the three volumes of Britain and Brown, you know, the flora, illustrated flora of the Northeast United States and Canada and stuff that goes across Canada comes down the Rocky Mountains sometimes. So I learned a lot from that. But being in Eastern Idaho, uh, we went every summer, a couple times to Yellowstone and to the Tetons. So we had a great love for the out of doors. Dad loved to go fishing. So he'd take me fishing. <clears throat> it was beneficial for both of us because he could catch two limits that way. 
So we had a hike out of the canyon, Snake River Canyon. He'd have two limits of fish in his creel and I have plants in my creel. So we're both very happy from the trip home. So then as a teenager, uh, for six summers in a row, I was uh, at the Boy Scout camp in the Teton Mountains uh, as a camp naturalist. So I taught trees and shrubs to first year campers and wildflowers to third year campers. And a lot of the scouts were older than I was, but I had the acquaintance with the plants. So I was on the camp staff to do that. So I went to college. Uh, Dad said, you know, we got to be a dentist because that way you can make good money and then have botany as your hobby. So I registered as pre-dent and took botany the first year. The second year I was teaching the lab courses that are usually taught by graduate students. So I was pretty well hooked on botany and I uh, got my bachelor's and master's degree at Utah State University and then my doctorate uh, in Southern California Claremont Graduate University, which has the Rancho Santa Ana Botanic Garden associated with it. Then I taught one year at Michigan State while the botanist there was on sabbatical leave. Then I was at uh, Kansas State University for 11 years, but took one year off from them to go to the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., which was interesting because I was then administering uh, grants to uh, my colleagues and seeing what they're doing all over the country and then back to Kansas State. And then when Bob Godfrey was retiring, uh, I threw my hat in the ring uh, for the position here, mainly to get my uh, chairman to pay me more back in Kansas, but uh, that didn't work. When I came to see right. Yeah, I, well, it, it, uh, Kansas State University, but then yeah. I, I applied to FSU when I came down and interviewed, I was so impressed with the uh, area and the uh, species richness and distinctness, particularly along the Apalachicola River system, that I was pleased to get offered the position here. So I've been here since 1974 and retired a lot earlier than I thought I would. I thought I would lecture till I no longer speak, but the state has that drop program which you have to enter at a certain age, but they dangled a big enough carrot that I uh, entered the drop program. So I've been retired uh, uh, 19 years now. So uh, those 19 years I've been mainly going out in the field and enjoying uh, collecting plants and looking for uh, species that are in counties where they had not been documented previously so that we have a better idea of their true distribution. Because it's easy to prove if a plant is present or not, but it's very difficult to prove that it's not present. So if it's present, it ought to be documented with a specimen. So that's what I've been doing the last several years is collecting uh, specimens for the herbarium uh, at FSU for uh, species that were not documented for the given county. So I'm wandering anywhere from Pensacola to the Suwannee River on the east side. Uh, so I'm driving further these days. I don't know what this year will bring with the higher gas prices, but, uh, but I'm eager to get out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. Well, Jim, you have a why don't you tell me what what plant families because you, you said you what yeah what plant families you were working on or okay. what you're most interested yeah well in. uh, i started out with the uh, members of the sunflower family the asteraceae which is the largest uh, flowering plant family the dicots the orchids are the largest in the monocots and different specialists argue as to which of those two is the yeah. most numerous, but they're both about the same size, well over 20,000 species in each of those families. Uh, it's sort of humorous. The genus I've worked on is called Chrysothamnus. Chrysos in Greek means golden, and thamnus means shrub. So locally out west, they're called rabbit brush. They're as common as sagebrush, but prettier because uh, they have bright yellow flowers in the fall. But uh, a botanist that was also a uh, uh, linguist uh, 
corrected me once. He says, uh, you call it chrysothamus. What do you call that big yellow palm palm flower? So that's chrysanthemum. He says, well, both those pronunciations, pronunciations are okay, but you ought to use the same. So I started calling it chrysothamus rather than chrysothamus. But here in uh, the panhandle, in the sandy areas, especially the dunes, we have a golden uh, woody goldenrod in the genus I call it chrysoma rather than chrysoma. So we have Latin that's been anglicized and then Americanized. So as I tell people that worry about how you pronounce the scientific name, just look at it, take a deep breath and say it. I think uh, that's great advice. I had a, one of my students, uh, John Nelson, I got his PhD here. Uh, Florida trader up in South Carolina, and his family of interest, the mints. So he came down to our Native Plant Society uh, chapter and gave a talk on mints once, and he was going on and on about um, the Florida betony. He says, some people call it stachys, and then some people call it stachys. says, either way, you're correct. And so I raised my hand and says, well, John, do you mean that in the mint family, uh, None of the pronunciations are mistakes. <laughs> it sort of broke him up a little bit, but uh, but that's the way it is. Uh, a lot of people just have an inversion to a scientific name because it's a scientific name. And I tease them and say, well, magnolia, gardenia, chrysanthemum, those are all scientific names. So uh, it's just a matter of looking at it and pronouncing it. Yeah, well. And so I, uh, I've worked on that family in Florida as well, but then in Florida I've <clears throat> published maybe about 10 or so species new to science that I find. Sometimes it's something that uh, has been collected before, but you realize that the uh, name that's been applied covers two different sorts of things, so one gets the, a new name, but it a few times I've collected things that were not represented in any collection at all. I was the first one to collect them, I guess, as a botanist and realized they were distinctive, so gave them a new name. Uh, then another uh, interest I had that sort of backed into, one of my uh, research tools was plant anatomy. I would uh, uh, pickle plant tissues and cut them on the microtool, make slides, and look at internal structure of the leaves, flowers, stems, etc. And uh, a colleague of mine uh, went with a very famous botanist from Harvard to uh, Afghanistan and collected uh, cannabis indica and said, uh, why don't you compare this with uh, the marijuana there in Kansas and see if they're any different or not. And, I thought, how did he get that? He actually took pickling material with me in mind and pickled these samples in Afghanistan. And so I put them on the shelf thinking, well, he must have had mafia connections. But a year or two later, I got curious. I went out uh, to Fort Riley, which is right outside of uh, Manhattan, Kansas, where the university is. And uh, cannabis sativa grows all over the place, a holdover from when it was raised as a hemp plant for fiber. And so uh, I pickled some and cut up them and found that the uh, woody tissues of the two species are so distinctive that I'm pretty convinced they are distinct species. They are wind pollinated, so they can be hybridized, but uh, actually it turns out that cannabis indica is generally more potent than cannabis sativa is because cannabis, cannabis sativa historically has been used as a fiber plant on the one extreme as an oil plant for either cooking or burning when they used candle light also as an edible plant the seeds were edible uh, and then medicinally and then also uh, recreationally so it, over the centuries it's been selected to be either a good fiber plant or a good psychoactive plant. And uh, the two don't appear in the same plant very often at all. But a lot of humor involved uh, a 
friend of mine uh, in Kansas, they were rewriting the law and uh, he testified that uh, the marijuana in Kansas wasn't very potent because it was mainly a fiber plant. And the legislator jumped on and says, I want it read on the record that Kansas marijuana is as good as anybody else's. So <laughs> by law it is, biologically it isn't, but by law it is. <laughs> I thought that was sort of humorous. But, uh, uh, well, so tell me about when you first got here to the Panhandle and because you got to spend a lot of time and learn from Godfrey and Golson. Um, well, I didn't get out with them as much because they had gold during the week and I was teaching classes, but uh, but I got on a few field trips. So on the first field trip I went with Bob Godfrey was an eye opener because we uh, walked uh, knee deep to thigh deep in the uh, Newport Springs run there down by uh, St. Mark's River. Yeah. And I was uh, bumping into cedar knees underwater and my eyes were pretty dilated looking for water moccasins. Oh. Didn't see any, but that was interesting. But since then I've been all over the place. I, I see snakes, but not as often as those that are looking for them. Uh, but uh, getting around in the panhandle just was an eye opener. There were so many shrubs that had sort of lance shaped dark evergreen leaves <laughs> they all looked alike but at least when they're flowered they looked a little different but there were some that looked much similar. more tropical down here but yeah but uh one of my first studies was a intensive study on dog island uh bob godfrey had and some of his faculty friends had a house on dog island so he was there uh certain weekends over a uh, 10 year period and collected intermittently. And I went down uh, and uh, was able to stay in the little eight unit motel they have on Dog Island uh, for free if I did the survey of the island. So I did a lot of work on Dog Island and that was one of the first uh, publications I did that was with uh, strictly Florida material. Uh, it's a fascinating area. And then uh, of course along the Apalachicola River, uh, as many of the botanists realize and the naturalists that E.E. Uh, e. Calloway, who was a county judge in Liberty County, uh, was also a theologian and an amateur uh, archaeologist. And he decided that the uh, Garden of Eden was along the Apalachicola River. And on the north side of Bristol, there is still the uh, uh, Garden of Eden Road and Trail uh, up there by the uh, uh, Allen Bluff area. And one of these arguments was that there were so many unique plants there that were found nowhere else in the world that they were left over from the garden. In fact, uh, Toria uh, wood is extremely uh, resistant to decay. So he figured it would be a good thing to, to build the ark. So he decided that gopher wood, the biblical gopher wood was from Toria. Again, with pronounced pronunciations, uh, uh, that uh, conifer is named after John Torrey, so you might call it Toria, but uh, Torrea is the way a lot of people pronounce it. So you get different pronunciations for the same word, but uh, the diversity along the river and the counties bordering the river are just fantastic. But uh, the uh, Nature Conservancy did a nice book on them. Uh, the American heritage, and they listed five continental areas of high uh, species diversity, and one of them was the uh, central panhandle of Florida along the Apalachicola River. So it's one of the five real hot spots uh, in the United States. So it's a neat area to be in, and you have 10 to 11 months a year that you can go out and botanize. In fact, there's a uh, always something blooming in uh, December and January. We've got a little gentian called wiregrass gentian. Well, all the species of gentian uh, bloom mainly in the winter time. So we have some that uh, don't bloom in the heat of the summer. But I thought with how hot and humid it was in Florida that the plants probably took a break and uh, 
July and had a high peak in uh, April, May, and June, then uh, early fall, another peak. But when I looked at several hundred species and graph them, you get a single bell curve with the highest number of species blooming in July. So when it's hottest and most humid, that's when the greatest number of species are blooming. Yeah. So you gotta be a little crazy to be a botanist yeah. out there collecting plants in the heat of the summer. Yeah. <laughs> but it's rewarding, it's it fun to do. Definitely. Well, tell us about collecting for the herbarium. Why don't you just explain a little bit for you know, some people who might not know what an herbarium okay. is and why. Well, herbarium uh, is not a female mortician. Uh, <laughs> 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 it is a collection of dried plants, a library with all the books on it. A, a herbarium has cabinets with uh, closable doors to keep insects from eating the dried plants, but you dry the specimen, glue it on uh, uh, archival paper, put a label on it, tell it where you got it, what it is, et cetera, and file them away. And we may have some species, we may have 30 or 40 samples of the same species and say, well, why so many? Well, it gives us an idea of its variability over its range. It might look different over by Pensacola than it does by Jacksonville. And so the uh, numbers of samples are important to understand the variability in the species. So the uh, collection then becomes a, a teaching resource for students. It becomes a reference point for state agencies and researchers throughout the country and throughout the world can borrow specimens of, of groups that they are studying intensely. And now with the uh, or uh, advanced technology, uh, a lot of the uh, specimens have been imaged now. So we have a virtual herbarium. Uh, the entire herbarium isn't uh, photographed that way, but uh, with databasing and photography, you can look at a specimen on the computer screen and actually see the uh, types of hairs they have uh, some people complain about botanical terminology. There's probably minimally 50 different terms that can be applied to plant hairs, <laughs> whether they're yeah. single-celled or multi-celled or branched or curved or prickly or soft or woolly. Or, uh, it's unbelievable a number of terms, but uh, with a good uh, photographic specimen, you can see all that detail. So that way we don't have to ship the specimens cross country all the time and uh, for specialists to look at, they can uh, observe 90% uh, of what they want to learn from just uh, the photo imagery. There might be one or two critical specimens they want to look at closely and, and actually uh, borrow the specimens, but it keeps them from being uh, worn out by being handled and shipped all over the country or the world, but that's the herbarium. It's a uh, collection of dried plant materials uh, that is curated and maintained uh, for research, for education, for reference. Another interesting thing about it is, particularly in England, where they've had uh, societies that have gone on for centuries, like their orchid society, they can demonstrate with the uh, specimens they have in their larger herbaria, global warming because some of those orchid species are blooming earlier in the year now than they did a hundred years ago or 200 years ago. So you have the historical aspect as well. Yeah. Do you remember what your first herbarium specimen was, your first collection? It was Menzelia, which is called Sticky Losa. It's in the Loisaceae family, beautiful, big yellow flower, creamy yellow flowered, uh, plant uh, in the deserts up in the Intermountain region and the leaves have little hooked hairs on them so you can grab a bit of it and slap it on your uh, shirt and it'll stay there. And that was the first specimen I collected was that it's called sticky losa because it would stick to you. It, uh, it only it had hairs that were sticky and it also had a little bit of a viscous uh, 
uh, fluid on it, which probably kept it from being chewed on by uh, herbivores. That was my first specimen. I collected about a thousand different species before I learned that you number them so you can keep track of them. So, oh, so your number is even higher than it really so, is. So, <laughs> yeah. So I'm up in the 34,000s, but uh, Godfrey was, he didn't quite make it, but he was almost up to 100,000. Wow. He was in the 95,000s, but then we teased Bob Godfrey. He was a hay baler. He would go in and collect everything. When I go to the field, I mainly collect things that are unusual in uh, their appearance or their species range, or it's a county record. So like last year, uh, two thirds of what I collected last year represented county records. So I'm a little bit uh, selective as to what I collect now, but it's fun to go out and collect and put them in a, it's important to put them in a collection because if you just verbally tell someone that you saw it, uh, they don't know if it was the standard form of that plant or if you identified it correctly but if the specimen's available, they can examine it themselves. So, so it's nice to have a specimen on hand to document that it occurs in a given county. It's a great way, it's a great way to actually track invasive species and their progression. Exactly, into exactly. We, I, the uh, Department of Agriculture years ago asked me if this particular member of the mustard family uh, was uh, a recent introduction, we had a collection from the 1930s and the uh, Florida State University Herbarium isn't as old as many because it was a woman's college until after World War II. And so the herbarium didn't really start to grow much until the late uh, 1940s, 1950s. But we had a specimen from the 1930s. So I said, hey, it's been around a while. They were concerned because it, it's, uh, a little species that if cows eat it, it uh, flavors their milk, not fresh milk, but when they pasteurize it, then the milk ends up with oh. a, a wet dog odor. <laughs> so, uh, so they were concerned because they didn't want it out there, but it, uh, it's most abundant in disturbed areas like uh, feedlots, but it's been here for a long time. It wasn't increasing in numbers, but uh, some plants we do, I remember there's one called Bouncing Bet, which is, uh, you can get an artificial soap from it. Uh, and uh, I first collected it uh, 40 years ago in the Panhandle, and now I see it fairly frequently. Funny thing, dandelions, which occur in every state of the Union, when I first came to Florida, I didn't see dandelions much. When they first saw them, they were in turf that had been brought into a, like a, a shopping center and they wanted some grass around the parking area. So they, they got turf farms probably in Southern yeah. Georgia that had dandelions in it. So dandelions pretty well throughout the state now, but originally it wasn't very common in Florida. So uh, these records uh, have the historical aspect to them as well. Mm -hmm. Well, it's still not very common in Central Florida here. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, we have the Asiatic false hawkweed. Hawkweed, with the it's very small and it has the little yellow flowers. Yeah. But I don't see you know your standard dandelion everywhere. Well, uh, one of the hawkweeds is Youngia japonica, which is an Oriental species, and it's pretty well everywhere. Uh, if you have fresh young leaves, they're you can throw them in your salad as you can dandelion leaves, but then usually dandelions sort of covered with soil <laughs> when you get them. But if you get fresh, uh, they're great. If the leaves are older, it's a little bit more bitter because they have a milky juice as does uh, a lettuce. And uh, they're in the same part of the family. Uh, in fact, the generic name of lettuce is lactuca and lactation refers to producing milk. So. The uh, lettuces are in the genus Lactuca because of their milky sap. When you fresh out of lettuce, you cut the base of it, you see that it is a little bit milky looking. So tell, tell us about your teaching experience at FSU and what you were 
Okay. Well, I taught, I taught basically the uh, plant science courses uh, over the years. Uh, information has exponentially exploded, you know, so that uh, the curriculum, uh, rather than expanding, they uh, pared down courses. So there's not as many botany courses offered now as there used to be, but we had uh, uh, plant diversity where they would learn about uh, from algae on up to flowering plants. Uh, and with the, usually through the fungi in there, but the fungi are in a kingdom of their own, but the zoologists never claimed them. So the botanists got them by default, I guess. But uh, so we had plant diversity. We had, uh, I taught uh, just about everything about plants except uh, their metabolism, their physiology. Field botany is one I particularly enjoyed because we learned the classification and theory, but also went out in the field and learned the local flora and the students had to collect, press and identify uh, a certain number of species as part of their grade. And so they learned the local flora and learned principles. And then of course that I developed uh, it's at other institutions too, but I call it plants of man. Sometimes it's called economic botany. In other words, uh, how plants impact society. And so in plants of man course, I talked about uh, food plants, uh, fiber plants, dye plants, uh, wood and wood products, uh, paper, uh, poisonous plants, weedy plants, medicinal plants, ended the course on a high note with uh, hallucinogenic plants. Uh, I enjoyed that course a lot. And a lot of students came back and said that was their favorite college course because they ended up teaching uh, high school biology. And there was such a vast amount of information in that course that it uh, was, uh, an underpinning for their teaching biology at high school level. I taught a course uh, usually to just a half a dozen to a dozen students at a time called uh, micro technique, where they learned how to uh, prepare plant tissues for the uh, microscopic study, how to uh, observe pollen grains, how to uh, make sections of wood thin enough that you see the individual cellular detail in wood. Uh, uh, things like that. Uh, so I did a lot of work with plant anatomy uh, and uh, chromosome counting is a area of research that uh, I would teach in a course as well, but uh, frequently uh, related species have the same chromosome number or in plants more often than in animals, the chromosome number might be doubled. So you have for example, in wheat, the, the uh, most primitive wheats have seven pairs of chromosomes. And then uh, Durham wheat, which is used in pasta and such, has 14 pairs of chromosomes. And bread wheat has 21 pairs of chromosomes. So you can see it's all in the same number, but there's a greater number of chromosomes in the more advanced ones. And so sometimes determining chromosome number helps you understand better the classification and relationship of a given new species you're looking at to its relative species. Yeah, I, you know, some of the things that I really appreciate when I get to go out in the field with you is w when you are talking about the anatomy of the plants that I, I don't have as much knowledge in. Um, like for example, the Durka, uh, that was so interesting. And you talked yeah. about, yeah, tell, talk about the Yeah, well, Durka is an interesting uh, shrub that's blooming right now. It's called leatherwood because the stems are so pliable, you can almost tie them in a knot without them snapping. But uh, I had done a little bit of anatomical work on that. And the flower buds actually develop rather deep in the stem tissue in the fall. And then during the winter, they push through the outer portion that we call the cortex and rupture into the open air in the spring. So they're 
the flowers yes, are really yes. deep seeded and uh, developed the year before. Of course, a lot of uh, bulbous plants, you know, your tulips, your amaryllis, all those, the flower bud is developed uh, long before you put that bulb in the soil, the bud's already there. And then it uh, uh, develops uh, during the winter and blooms. Uh, but uh, this is one of the fascinating things about life itself. If you uh, use a telescope and look at the stars or you use uh, your eyes and look at what you can see or you use a hand lens or go to an electron microscope and look at something that's been magnified thousands of times at every level, there's beauty there and unity and organization that is uh, just fascinating. Some of the uh, flowers uh, that look attractive, uh, if you get a hand lens on them, you find intricate uh, detail in uh, the color distribution along veins, or there might be speckled, look like they've been splattered with paint or something, or uh, you'll have hairs that are uh, in lines or in particular patterns on the tissues. So at any level, magnification from uh, distant or close up, uh, fantastic. Speaking of distant, it, uh, it amuses me. I, I can frequently identify a species driving down the road at 60 miles an hour and I notice a species. So I do a U-turn when it's safe and pull over and collect it. Challenge is with many of our back roads, they're so rough and unpaved that you can't drive 60 miles an hour. So on those, I have to stop the car and get out and look at them to identify them. <laughs> Another interesting fact um, it was the Harper callus about the differences in carpels. Um, oh yeah, I uh, sometimes you can armchair philosophize and there may be no truth to it whatsoever, but uh, Harper callus is an interesting member of the lily group, uh, six tepals, of course there's a technical term again. The flower has an outer whorl of appendages called sepals, an inner whorl called petals, but if they look alike, you call them collectively tepals. So there's six tepals in the uh, uh, Harper's Beauty is the common name for Harper Ocalis. Harper was a botanist around 1900 and a Florida State graduate student in the 1960s discovered it down uh, in uh, near Sumatra in the panhandle here and realized it's so distinct that it had to have a genus name, not just a species name. So I named it Harper Ocalis because Ocalis is a uh, combined farm used uh, for lilies. Probably has something to do with uh, beauty. Mm -hmm because uh, Kali refers to, to beauty as well. So most of these are rather attractive. But anyway, mm -hmm. uh, for years, the only Harper Callus we knew was along, <laughs> <laughs> lilies are cute, uh, was along the uh, Highway 65. And I was uh, giving a talk once and had a picture with two Harper's Beauties side by side. And all of a sudden I realized that one of them had five stigmas, those are the receptive areas on top of the ovary, and it should have three, but it had five, and I thought, good heavens. You know, I had to take a picture of it to have it enlarged to tell what was there. So I went back to the highway, and over a three-year period, I inventoried, and the majority of the flowers along Route 65 had four, five, or six units in the ovary, uh, where lilies standardly have three. So this multiplication was there and I uh, thought, well, why? Uh, and then I got thinking, uh, well, maybe it's because uh, something along the highway is bothering them. I checked the weather and uh, one year was an exceptionally wet year. The next year was dry. Uh, one was hot and then, so it wasn't temperature or humidity. But uh, one thing that I did strike upon was that it was around the late 18, 18, 19. <laughs> You're not that old. 
1990, they, they stopped using leaded gas and leaded exhaust from cars is toxic to a lot of things. And maybe that was disturbing the plants because for a while we didn't know that anywhere it occurred except along the highway. But then uh, one of the uh, botanists for the uh, National Forest started finding it uh, off the highway where you have a uh, the uh, end ecotone, the inter uh, section between uh, Longleaf Pine Slope and a wet uh, Cypress Stringer. And that's where you'd find Harper's Beauty. And everything off the highway had three carpels, three stigmas. But along the highway, that higher number was the predominant. So I thought something there is bothering them. So that's my theory is that uh, it was uh, lead poisoning because in the last couple decades, the uh, multiple carpels aren't showing up as much as they used to. So are there any? Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, no. I was just wondering if that's named after Roland Harper, Roland M. Harper. Roland Harper, he's, he's the one. He did a lot of uh, early studies in Florida. There's a famous area just southeast of Chipley called Rock Hill. It's not the highest area, but it's got a, a sort of a sandstone. They call it siltstone or uh, uh, another name for it, but it's, a, it's in the sandstone group. But it has, uh, from that uh, rock that decompos decomposition uh, species that occur there, they're found nowhere else in the state. And he did a lot of work with that. So Rock Hill's another interesting area. The uh, one of the uh, reasons I got interested in uh, botany of Florida was that uh, historically the genus Chrysothamnus was placed in a, a genus called Chrysoma, Chrysocoma, which uh, also included uh, Bigloia, which is our little rayless goldenrod. And on uh, Rock Hill, we have a species of rayless goldenrod that uh, is very rare. Uh, it was discovered by Thomas Natal, and he described it so beautifully, but he chose as his specimen accidentally the common species. Oh, really? Bigloia <laughs> new data. So he called it uh, Vergata. But Vergata becomes a synonym because the rules say that the specimen oh, is the, the basis yeah. of the name. So his type specimen was actually Bigloia new data, even they called it and then named Vergata. So Vergata was reduced to synonymy. So this species that he named so well in description technically had no name. So I named it uh, Bigloia natalii yeah. after him since he's the one that really found it. Yeah. And it occurs on uh, Rock Hill. But there's also a little population done within the city limits of St. Petersburg, where it's growing on pure sand. Oh. And the Rock Hill uh, population has 18 chromosomes. The one on uh, um, St. Petersburg has, uh, what, 52? It's, wow. Interesting. It's a, what we call a polyploid, and uh, it seems more close related to some of the big Loya Natalii that's in eastern Texas. So this rare one occurs from uh, rock outcrops in Georgia into uh, Rock Hill, Florida, and into northern Alabama. And there's a tidbit of it in Louisiana and then some in eastern uh, Texas, and then there's this weird population down in St. Petersburg. And again, with armchair philosophy, when uh, the uh, Pleistocene had so much water uh, tied up in ice, yeah. the sea level was much lower. And so there was a corridor from Texas to Florida Panhandle that was much more accessible. and the St. Petersburg populations look more like the Texas population than anything else. So and there's some other members of the sunflower family that uh, do the same that thing. grow around Corpus Christi yeah. and they're found uh, on some of the keys around uh, 
St. Petersburg. That's interesting. But not in the uh, Northern Gulf states uh, between those two. So there may have been a, a land bridge, uh, a highway, you might say, from Texas to Florida. Of course, uh, during the Pleistocene, Florida was twice as wide as it is now. And when all that water melted, then uh, Southern Florida was an island uh, and uh, separate from, uh, I guess, uh, Gainesville and uh, was a beachfront then because south of Gainesville was underwater, basically. And we can look forward to what global warming may do. We may have beachfront closer to Tallahassee and in another century. But I'm on the north side of town where it's higher. You'll be all right. <laughs> I won't be around when the water rises that yeah. high. <laughs> Well, so that those disjunct populations are, I find, really interesting. Oh, they're, and yeah, they're fascinating. You, you wonder how they happen. Now, uh, we have a little. Uh, it's called twin flower because two of them are side by side in the acanth. They see the genus is Discaristi. There's three species in the genus: two in North Florida and a third one down in South Florida. Well, I found that South Florida one at uh, St. Mark's Wildlife Refuge in a very remote part of the refuge yeah. where I'm sure no one brought it in, but a tropical storm could have moved the seeds and it got established there. It's not just one population, I saw two or three, very close to the Gulf in remote parts of the refuge. So that may have been moved by nature. Uh, some of them are moved by human activity. One of the terrible things is that uh, uh, sportsmen that have their boats in the water, uh, weeds get caught on the propeller and they don't clean it up and they go to another lake in another county and, and those plants get established. So weeds are sometimes distributed by uh, uh, mechanical means that... Uh, Car tires and boots yeah. as well. well. A crazy thing, another uh, little member in the... Uh, we used to call it the Scrofulary AC, but that plant has been divided up so much. But we have uh, a uh, common species called Macaronia that's got a uh, white flower with a little bit of pinkish violet to it. But there's a yellow flowered one that grows right on the ground that's common in South Florida. And I found it over at Palatka. And then I realized it was in the lawn at the edge of their motor pool and the St. John's River Water Management District runs clear down to Melbourne, but their headquarters are in Palatka. Mm. And here's the big, wow. big heavy duty uh, vehicles uh, 50 feet away from this big population of uh, Southern Florida wow. species. So I think it came up on mud on tires and got established. Since then, I've found it in other places in the Florida Panhandle, but they're always in disturbed areas near a road. So I think it's been moved by, by humans that way. Of course, some of them are moved by birds. Uh, the uh, tallow tree is a terrible weed, oh, yeah. but it's got a very heavy waxy coat on the seed. And if birds eat the fruit, the seed probably just passes right through them because it's lubricated with all that wax. And when they perch uh, and drop it, then you have uh, another population popping up and it's all over the place. It's a, terribly invasive uh, tree species that is moved by birds, basically. And a lot of uh, uh, species that have lightly colored, particularly red fruits are uh, juicy, but the seeds have a very heavy seed coat, so they'll pass through a bird's gut. Mm -hmm. And they get some of your weediest species like the coral ardizia, which is very common in North Florida in our city parks and such, uh, is moved a lot by birds. What do you think about the disjunction of several species between the Carolinas and Apalachicola region? Oh, that is interesting. I don't know how that happened, but we have, as I said, well, I was talking about the chrysoma, that uh, bushy goldenrod. It's in the sandy areas from uh, Franklin County on over towards uh, 
New Orleans, and then it's in the Sand Hills in central South Carolina, which was at one time beachfront, mm -hmm. but it's not known from Georgia. So uh, there's uh, a big gap. There's in a Georgia. lot of things that jump yeah. Georgia. There's a, a golden aster in the uh, genus Chrysopsis that's up in uh, South Carolina, and it's in the far western panhandle. There's a uh, a member of the uh, Clematis, the Virgin's Bower uh, genus that occurs in uh, the Carolinas, and there's a single population over uh, in Walton County. Uh, so we have a lot of these. The uh, well, the the sundews are neat little carnivorous plants. We have a uh, some of them. The sundews have a rounded leaf that looks like a pad with a little glandular hairs on it to catch insects, but we have one where the leaf is long and thread-like, so we call it dew threads because the uh, glandular hairs look like dew in the sun, but they catch bugs. So the dew thread in Florida panhandle is the uh, dry sky, but they have one that looks like it that's only a third of the size, and ours is pale green, theirs is a purplish green, up in the Carolinas, but we have two or three plants, populations of it uh, in Washington County. And they actually found a hybrid between the two. And the crazy thing, it's variety California. <laughs> the specialist uh, got it and grew it in his greenhouse and named it Californica. And it has nothing to do with California, yeah. but the name sticks because that's the name we put on it. Yeah. But after that, we did find natural hybrids. And there was one spot in uh, uh, Washington County where the uh, dew thread, the big native uh, Tracy eye is all over the place. But that one little seepage area, that little purple leaved uh, one filiformis from the uh, Carolinas is there. And the hybrid is there. Mm -hmm. So that's weird. Uh, so sometimes there's these wide distributions. Of course, when you have enough time, you know, going back in geological time, we speak of Pangea when all the continents are in one big glob. Well, a lot of Eastern Asia and Southeastern United States are in common. The genus Magnolia, for example, is very, well, what's blooming in Tallahassee now, the pink ones, those are, uh, oriental magnolias and magnolias a common genus in uh, Japan and China and in the southeastern U.S. There's several genera that uh, jump from uh, the orient to the southeastern U.S. Uh, we have fossil records uh, of them in between but they're no longer growing there because conditions have changed. Terea is one of them. Yeah there's there is a species of Terea uh, on the west coast, but then there's two or three species in uh, China, Japan, that are one here uh, in Florida that just barely makes it into Georgia. But uh, when they built the Jim Woodruff Dam and uh, the Lake Seminole, it uh, flooded a lot of the Toria. Uh, and what's left is uh, being uh, ravaged by a fungus that has been around forever, but apparently there was a tipping point in the, uh, what we call the microenvironment that made the fungus uh, more uh, invasive and, and it's hurting the Torea. But this Callaway who said that uh, the Garden of Eden was on the river said, this was not one of the Lord's examples that is letting the Torea being killed because we don't need it for an ark. Of course, nowadays we'd have a one of these big Exxon uh, steamers <laughs> rather than a metal arc rather than a wooden arc because we're going to move animals again. Yeah. <laughs> well, so the the fusarium that is killing the trea yeah. is actually, um, they recently did the genetic work on it mm -hmm. at UF and they found, they suspect that it's introduced actually because it's in a basal clade okay. and it's only other two members of that clade are endemic to China. Aha, uh -huh. so that, that is interesting. Yeah, and that would also show, prove, you know, reasoning as to why it declined so quickly. Yeah, yeah. because it had no resistance to it, but uh, 
But then environmental change came along as well because Golson, yeah. who lived there in Chattahoochee, he observed it as a, so abundant as the youth and saw its decline and uh, the decline sort of uh, coincided with the heavy logging of mm -hmm. the longleaf pine well, yeah. above the- I the, see that a lot with, because it's creating erosion essentially, you know, and yeah. it really changes the chemistry yeah. and the composition of the soils yeah, right. and the yeah. ravines. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of people don't realize that uh, if you mess with the environment, it can be really, really uh, harmful. Harmful, and some people just think as long as it's green out there, it's okay. But our native species are so important because they're a tremendous uh, food source for pollinators that pollinate our agricultural crops. For those of the people that don't want diversity just because it's beautiful to have diversity. If they want to talk economics, we need our native flora to keep the pollinators alive when the crops aren't available for them. And if the pollinators aren't available, then we won't have the crops. So it'll hurt us if we mess with the native flora too much because mm -hmm. uh, they're all interrelated. Yeah, you've probably seen a lot of changes in and invasive species and and just other you know development etc in the in the panhandle. Yes, uh, some of them. Uh, the uh, we have a a tradescantia that's white flowered, mm -hmm. flowered oh, really nice. beautiful, but uh, most of them are blue flowered. But the white flowered one can form a uh, ground cover that just smothers everything. And in the Torreya area, the floodplains of the Apalachicola River, you have this green carpet that's a single species. <laughs> and it's uh, once you get it, it's hard to get rid of. I was over in Calhoun County and saw some that was just totally vegetative. I thought it's got to be Tredescantia fluminensis, but I'm not positive. So I just took a little sprig and put it in one of my flower pots of the house. And now I've got uh, oh, Lord. about 20 square feet of solid of oh that. My gosh. I, I tear it up <laughs> frequently, but it's yeah. it's there permanently yeah. now. And I'm the culprit. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes I we have a little uh, member of the Forget Me Not family, uh Myosotis, uh, that uh, has a real prickly uh, seed pod and I was, had collected some and I was pressing them in my driveway and had a, an extra one I think I threw it down and now I've got a good sized population along the edge of my driveway. It's not a common species yeah. but uh, sometimes it just takes one or two seeds and you've got a new population yeah. <laughs> whether you want it or not. Are there any questions? Do people have specific questions? Yes, from early on, um, Bonnie, Bonnie Basham, our president, requested um, Lauren tell us how many plants that he has uh, identified, I mean, described, vouchered. discovered, oh. vouchered. Or, or described. Okay, yes. described as new, about a dozen in the Western United States and about a dozen in Florida. So somewhere around two dozen that I've been involved with the naming. That's awesome. Awesome. And how many voucher specimens? Oh, well, 34,000 and counting. But uh, for the last six years, I've averaged over 400 new county records for a given species for a given county in the Florida Panhandle. So that's what keeps me going now is the uh, uh, getting out, being active, at least the bottom half of my body works. Uh, if you're a Harry Potter fan, you know that Patronus was his symbol of, uh, of his specialty. His Patronus was a white stag. Me being a botanist, I decided that my Patronus should be a plant. Uh, so uh, I named it the Snapdragon. My mind is snapped and the rest of my body's dragon. <laughs> <laughs> we got to hear that one earlier tonight. <laughs> but 
Any other questions in particular? Uh, yes, and Bonnie also would like Lauren to finish one of your favorite sayings, sedges have edges. Oh, yes. Oh, uh, there are several uh, large plant families that look alike unless you see them in flower or fruit. The rushes, the sedges, and the grasses well, the sedges often have a triangular stem, and so we have a little mnemonic device to help separate them. Sedges have edges, rushes are round, grasses have joints, when cups aren't around. <laughs> of course, there's a few species in each family that don't know that, yes. and they look a little different. There's some sedges that are uh, have round stemmed, uh, like sawgrass has grass in its name, but it's really in the sedge family. Uh, and so there's a few that don't know the rules. Most sedges have triangular stems, but then we have a, a spike rush in the genus Eleocris. The species name was Quadrangulata. It decided to go a little bit extreme and have four edges to the stem rather than three. <laughs> You know, some, some people just have to take it a little too far, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so I, you were saying before we got on that, you know, you have the strategy to have a list for, for counties that don't have plants. Right, yeah. The uh, University of South Florida maintains an, uh, on the Internet a, an atlas of the plants of Florida. And so uh, you key in on that and uh, there's a little box where you type in a species name and uh, comes up with details including a map of the state with all the counties outlined and if the county has been documented with a specimen in a herbarium a research collection then the county is shaded in well years ago when I was sick I sat down and looked at the lists and opened a book and went down the index and well, this ought to be in that county but it's not there so i'd write it down so now i have um, on the computer uh, a county list for all the panhandle counties so when i go over to holmes county for example i take that list a hit it's list a page and a half long <laughs> and these are things that ought to be there but haven't been documented and so that's why my documenting numbers are fairly high at times because I sort of have a, a list that I keep an eye out for. Sometimes I find things that are not on the list and weren't in the county. And every now and then I turn up one that's absolutely new to the state. I picked up one uh, late November or early December down in the uh, little uh, northern projection of Bay County there that uh, near Fountain that uh, it's the first report for any of the southeastern states. It's been collected in uh, Louisiana and I think in the Carolinas, but it's an oriental species. And it's in the grape family. It looks a little bit like uh, uh, Virginia creeper, but is technically quite different. And I was shocked to see it uh, covering a tree. It just totally covered the tree and its leaf color was a little bit different. That's what drew my attention to it. Uh, and uh, so I got it vegetatively, but it was easily identified. First report from the entire state. So I can go back this year and see if I can find it blooming to get a better understanding of what it really looks like. But it's from Japan. Uh, and uh, we have a lot of exotics. Exotic and invasive are two terms that are sometimes used uh, together, but they're not the same. Exotic means it's not native to your area, and invasive means it's displacing species in your area. So some plants can be invasive and be native, like the uh, uh, muscadine grape. It is a native, but it can be terribly invasive and not all exotics are invasive. Some of them just barely hang on, but a lot of the exotics do become invasive because they get here without the plant diseases that bothered them back home or the bugs that bothered them back home. And so here they have a new environment and they go 
gangbusters. So we have a lot of things from uh, Central and South America because Florida is sticking out in the Gulf and the Caribbean like it does. It's hitting from three sides from the tropics and then one side from the more temperate zones. And then we have with ports of call like Miami and Pensacola and New Orleans, we have a lot of things introduced into the South that come from Asia or Europe or Africa. So we get a lot of invasive exotics in uh, Florida. So uh, that is a challenge and it's uh, gonna be a continuing challenge with the uh, shift in the uh, environment uh, temperature wise that uh, some of these exotics might become uh, more invasive and we'll be challenged to maintain our flora which is, it's ironic, I've sat on the Florida Endangered Plant Advisory Council for over 35 years, and we rate the native species that are really, really rare as endangered, and we're concerned about conserving them, but they're also those most likely to go extinct with climate change. So it's sort of a interesting, uh, situation to be on a committee that's working to save them. But uh, if we don't control the climate better, uh, we're not gonna save them, but they're uh, worth saving. And we're trying to. <laughs> Any other questions or do you? Uh, well, a lot of the plants that uh, we know of from South Florida are showing up in North Florida now. Like the mangroves. Oh, uh, yeah. The mangrove, uh, I, like I said, I, one of my first intensive studies was at Dog Island, and I found red mangrove papagils. You know, they look like little torpedoes washed up on the beach, but they never did get established. But now they are getting established. And so we have that situation when I, years ago, uh, I collected a uh, legume down in Perry, Florida that really puzzled me. And it, using the local flora that Plural wrote, it wasn't there. And I was thumbing through the library on uh, a book on the legumes of East Africa and saw an illustration that was it. Perfectly. And after I knew what it was, I found that it was a common weed in South Florida, but here it was up in Perry, Florida. The next year I found it in Tallahassee. Now it's in nearly half the Panhandle counties, and it's called Indigofra uh, spicata, and it's a terrible little weed. Beautiful flowers, but uh, it grows flat on the ground, so it uh, ruins your lawn. Uh, and it's toxic, uh, the concern they had in South Florida was on their uh, um, big spreads, their horse farms that are uh, very toxic for uh, horses. So it's spreading north. Uh, so we have a lot of plants that uh, are blooming earlier that have been here before, but they're blooming earlier now. Uh, and this is over a period of years, because any given year, you might have a, a cold snap that will change the blooming time. But generally, things are blooming a little bit earlier than they used to. And then some plants that get, like when I first came here, the uh, camper tree was a lot of the trees around town with the camper tree because it was raised uh, for uh, commercial purposes back in the 1920s as a medicinal plant. And uh, trees are very attractive unless you get them frozen, then they just look terrible, but they will re-sprout. But uh, we haven't had a killing frost now for many years. It got down to 19 last month, but it was up above freezing within half of six but hours so yeah, it has to be an extended if you get period. cold it's got to stay cold for a little bit of a period before the plant is really terribly damaged 
Uh, some plants will uh, will show damage if it gets to 35 degrees, but uh, most of our plants need to get in the low 20s and have it stay cold for uh, 24 hours or more for them to really show damage. But I uh, haven't seen damage on camper trees for decades now, but back in the 1980s, uh, when we had some really cold weather, uh, it just looked terrible because they weren't uh, adapted to that cold weather. Yeah, and you know, when I was growing up here in Tallahassee, most people couldn't grow most citrus because we would have these occasional very, you know, hard freezes. Right. And people might grow them for a few years and then they would die. But then now, like you can grow all kinds of citrus up exactly, here in Tallahassee. Yeah. They're growing yeah. everything. Yeah. Yeah, I actually had Gene Huffman come visit. Hopefully we'll have a lunch and learn in the future once I look at that footage. Um, but she brought us citrus, you know, so imagine someone from North Florida bringing someone from Central Florida citrus because, you know, we don't have, uh, you know, we have the citrus greening here in Central Florida really badly and it's, it's not so bad up in North Florida. Okay, so uh, Mac Camacho, Sierra asks, is there a unicorn plant that has evaded you that you have yet to experience you've been looking for? Which? A unicorn plant oh, that has evaded you. That is, since I was at Kansas State University for several years, the unicorn plant in uh, the Midwest is a common weed, especially in feedlots. It uh, looks like a catalpa bloom and the young fruit it's sometimes called a pro proboscis because it's swollen where the seeds develop and it has a long curved tube that as it grows that uh, the green part, the uh, mesoderm uh, falls off and the inner part of the capsule becomes rock hard and those prongs open up and then it's called devil's claw because they, they're hooked uh -huh. and they get caught in uh, livestock hooves and get moved that way. Uh, on my little end table by the front door, I've got three samples. I've got Provo City, Louisianica. I've got uh, Ibicella, Lutea, which uh, is a little smaller fruit, but the whole fruit body is spiny. And I've got Martinia annua that I picked up in Panama where the fruit's only an inch and a half long and the spurs are really, really short. Mm. And again, you can get carried away with your theories, but there aren't any large animals in native uh, Panama, so maybe they don't <laughs> adapt oh, to yeah. the big hooks. And here up where we have the uh, bison and the horse and livestock, the big devil's claw has those big, big horns. Uh, since I was an anatomist, I wanted to uh, study the development of that fruit because it was really fascinating. When they're young enough, they can be pickled and eaten like uh, pickled cucumbers, you know. But uh, when it gets mature, it's really hard. You'd never eat it. But uh, so I was trying to grow seed uh, plants to observe their study and I couldn't get them to germinate. And I found out that if I uh, used gibberellic acid on them, which is a growth stimulant, they would germinate, but they would uh, get rather gangly. And the ones, and I found that if I uh, got the seeds moist and uh, went into the photographic dark room where I could barely see and peel off the uh, seed coat and just leave the embryo, in the petri dish in the dark they would germinate and so i had some that were germinated that way and they were much smaller than the gibberellic acid one but they uh, bloomed first because they uh, caught up mm -hmm. so the gibberellic acid gave it a head start but then it was detrimental later on so i wrote a little paper that's the only paper i ever written on plant physiology was on the effects of gibberellic acid on the devil's claw <laughs> So it does occur in Florida very, very sporadically. I've not seen it in Florida, but I've seen samples from Florida, but through the uh, Midwest uh, and the Southwest, 
the devil's claw is abundant. So you're still hoping to find it in Florida? Oh, well, yes and no. We don't want it because it's really weedy, but it's a fascinating plant. And the cinch now, common names uh, apply to the same plant with different age. It's first called a proboscis flower because the uh, the two halves are fused together, and then as a as the outer skin, you know, like think of an a, a peach, you know, the out the soft part falls off, and then the peach pit is the woody part. Well, the peach pit woody part is the part that becomes the devil's claw, and the two. Uh, section pop open and they're curved up real tight and they're just open enough that the seeds fall out the back. But you can set them down on the table and with the uh, flower stalk attached to the capsule and those big talons out the back, it sits like a little rocker and some of them paint them and they look like birds <laughs> sitting on the, <laughs> sitting on the tabletop. But I've got the three genera there at my house, the uh, pinkish white, um, Probacidia, the yellow flowered Ibisala, and then the little purple flowered Martinia from Panama. So I've seen three of them. Okay, so before I go for the next question, uh, we have calls for Encore already. Yeah. yeah, like a part two. So, uh, <laughs> all right. I don't have any appetite for that, but um, there is demand. We eat the apple, you can have the core. <laughs> <sighs> okay, uh, let's see. Okay, this question. Um, Richard Morud says Dr. Anderson is the longest serving member of our Endangered Plant Advisory Council and our most respected oracle. Maybe you should put that on your CV. Yeah. Well, that's the pot calling the kettle black. Richard is, uh, he's a nurseryman, but he's extremely knowledgeable, not of Florida plants, but he's traveled worldwide. Uh, I was uh, jealous of him being down in New Caledonia Ooh. two years ago, and he photographed some uh, yellow eye grass, the genus Iris. And if you know me, my, my, uh, license plate is the native plant thing, but instead of a number, the name Cyrus is on the license plate. So uh, he photographed some down from New Caledonia that looked a lot like the one that I named as a new species ah, in St. Mark's Wildlife Refuge. I'm sure they're not closely related, but they're in the same genus. Tell them <laughs> so, about hello, that Richard. <laughs> yeah, tell them about that species that I was going to see in. Right? Which, Is it Zyrus Panacea? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, back in uh, 2007 was one of our driest years on record. And I'd been doing a lot of work at the wildlife refuge. I've got a species list over 1,600 species from the wildlife refuge. And there's a lot of ponds in the west end of the wildlife refuge. And they were drying up. So I noticed that this yellow eyed grass, there's Chapman named uh, probably a dozen species himself. There's a lot of yellow eyed grasses in uh, Florida in the southeast, but I noticed this one uh, out in these uh, drying puddles looked a little different. So I got some, and it, uh, it looked so different that I sent some to Bob Crawl, who was a, an authority on that genus, and he agreed that it was different. So uh, he came down, and we went out. And, was rather humorous because uh, he's a little heavier than I, and he got stuck in the mud out there, and I had to get a one of these uh, narrow bladed shovels they call a sharpshooter, and took it out to him so he could put his weight on that and and get out. And so, oh my uh, gosh! So I already fruit of the crawl, crawl there, and was <laughs> getting out of the type locality of. <laughs> uh, my name is Iris Panacea, and you know, science articles are so boring, even for scientists. But I, uh, I said that it was named Panacea because it was in the Panacea unit of the refuge. I said, then in parenthetical, I said, 
has no known medicinal value. And one of the reviewers said, well, that ought to be struck from your article and says, why? It's informative and some people may want, may want to know why I called it panacea. So it isn't a panacea as far as a cure-all is concerned, but it's in the panacea unit of the wildlife refuge. But uh, I per persisted and it stayed in the article. <laughs> But it does look different, and it's in about uh, half of the ponds that I investigated. Uh, this is how crazy botanists are. There was this one where I saw there was a, a little peninsula going out into a pond that had pine saplings on it. I thought it was pretty steady looking, so I walked along, and, and the yellow eyed grass was right at the tip of this little peninsula. The peninsula was only four or five feet wide, so I was walking along carefully. And as I was walking along, I noticed I was also becoming submerged. So the peninsula was really a floating Man. unit rather than grounded. When I got to the plants, I was looking at uh, some big light brown spiders that were walking on the water and we were eye to eye. And I thought, I hope he doesn't bite. And I thought if I sink, six more inches that <laughs> never find me, but at least uh, I got stabilized then. So I got the plant and took it home and put it in a big barrel in the backyard and it bloomed the next year. So I also got information about it. So blooming period, it blooms earlier than a lot of the species do. There's a species that grows right with it, but blooms uh, uh, three to five in the afternoon. and. My new species blooms uh, 10 to 12 in the morning. Uh, there are other technical features that really separate the two, but they can grow side by side. And they may not even pollinate if they have a, a narrow uh, receptiveness of the stigma because the uh, pollen's released at different times of the day. Hmm. So now and then we find things that are really, really interesting, right? in our backyard, so to speak. It's embarrassing. I've collected uh, at least two state records that came out of my yard and they're weedy. One was a, a legume, uh, a vetch in the genus Vicia that's got pale yellow flowers. It's from uh, Europe, but it's only known from two or three sites in the entire United States. And there it was in my yard. A lot of people probably thought I seeded it the year before, but I didn't. I just noticed it because I don't mow my lawn that frequently. So it was blooming with uh, two other viscias. So I had three viscias all within a square meter there. <laughs> but it was, uh, and I, was, I was rather happy that I found it down in the National Wildlife Ref National Forest uh, uh, a year later, so it's not just in my yard, but saw it first in my yard. So, <laughs> yeah. so on that same thread, uh, Clara Mullins asks, does Dr. Anderson have a plant that is supposed to exist in Florida that he has not been able to locate? Oh, I'm sure there are plenty. Uh, uh, and we don't, a lot of people, well, they realize that if they drive from here to Key West, they realize the state is really long. And South Florida, North Florida might be getting a little bit more similar uh, climate wise now, but they're really quite distinctive. And so when I get to South Florida, I'm a stranger in paradise. You know, I know, I know the widespread species, but some of the common things down there. I can place them to family or genus, but not necessarily to species right off the bat. But uh, there are a lot of things in the state that uh, have historically been seen, but haven't been seen recently that I haven't run across. Uh, occasionally you run across something that uh, uh, is rewarding in other ways. I, since I studied, uh, rabbit brushes that are related to the golden rods and 50 years ago I was studying golden rods in rather detail and there were some species that I knew only from the literature and then uh, Lily and I were over uh, Chattahoochee uh, uh, last fall and there was a golden rod in bloom that uh, 
I put a name on, but I'd never seen it before. Then I realized it was one that I'd learned 50 years ago from the literature, but it was the second collection uh, for the state of Florida. May have been the same site because Bob Godfrey got it in the Chattahoochee area 30, 40 years earlier. <laughs> but I hadn't seen it in the wilds, but I'd read about it. And then to see the characteristics, they pop up and say, hey, that's it. And that's rewarding. Sometimes uh, you find things that, that really surprise you. Uh, we have a very attractive member of the Camellia family called Moblale Bay, the genus Gordonia that grows through uh, the uh, upper two thirds of Florida in wetland areas and I studied it, uh, studied it with electron microscopy. The hairs of the stomates were so distinctive and I looked at related things and a related genus is the genus Franklinia named after Benjamin Franklin. It was discovered by the Bartram father and son in the 1770s along the Alatamaha River in Georgia. He was a uh, a botanist that got some of his living by preparing specimens for uh, sponsors in Europe as well as the US. And he sent seed of it around, but it wasn't seen in the wilds after about 1802. So it's only known now from cultivation. Well, since I was interested in that whole family, when I was at the British Museum in London, I was looking at members of the uh, Camellia family from Southeast Asia. The British Museum is so large that they uh, don't list uh, a genus by species alphabetically. They list the genus in sections like Asia, Africa, Europe. And so in Southeast Asia, I was looking through specimens and found Bartram's original collection upon which the species was named in the Southeastern uh, Asian folder. So I told the curator, hey, this is what you have. And this is the, uh, what we call a poster child or the endangered species concept in the United States because it's not been seen in the wilds for uh, about 200 years. Uh, and so that was rather fascinating to find it, uh, that the species specimen was still around and that's, <clears throat> It's like the Bureau of Standards, it's the specimen to which the name belongs. Uh, and so that's the specimen that uh, is the standard if you want to compare anything else that you think might be Franklinia, that's what you refer back to as that original specimen. So now they've got it filed properly, uh, but it was originally <laughs> stuck in a folder from Southeast Asian material. I did get a seed from uh, Southeast Asia from a professor over 40 years ago that I was able to germinate and I put it in my yard and it had grown for 40 years, beautiful shrub, never did bloom, I thought it never would. And then uh, two summers ago, I was driving home late afternoon and the afternoon sun was shining on the tree canopy of my uh, yard. And I saw this sort of creamy yellow white covering along the top of the tree and I about ran off the road. It was blooming after 40 years. And so my grandson forbade me to climb after it. So he went up a ladder and then used my uh, extension uh, tree trimmer and we snipped a couple branches so I'd get some specimens. So I sent a specimen back to the University of Singapore where they had the original uh, specimen that the professor had put in the collection of money, uh, collected the seed that he gave me. So I sent them back to a specimen of this, is what it looks like when it grows in the other side of the world. <laughs> Took it 40 years to decide to bloom, but it bloomed last year also. So I'm thinking this summer, it will be its third year of blooming. Gorgeous, looks very much like uh, sort of a, in between the uh, uh, Loblolly Bay and the Franklinia and it's called Shima Wallichii. Wallich was a famous uh, botanist in Southeast Asia, so it was named after him. So, so there's you... always these little tidbits that are fascinating. Uh, any field you get into, you uh, get your rewards uh, in that field, but uh, botany is 
crazy to use the way we use terms, but it's a fruitful field. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <to live. laughs> I can, can't leave it alone. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> the kernel of truth in that. <laughs> well. Oh, my God. So can your tree, like, can it, is it reproductive? Can it make seeds that are viable? What? The can tree. tree oh, it hasn't produced fruit. And maybe it needs to be cross-pollinated. And if that's the case, it's not going to happen because I can't get back to Southeast Asia and bring some pollen. <laughs> In fact, I can't even climb up there and self-pollinate it if, it if it'll work that way because it's too high. Up. It's about 40 feet off the ground and uh, the branches aren't going to support me. My grandson would tie me down if I tried to climb it. But it hasn't produced any fruit that I can tell. Uh, so it's probably uh, many species are infertile within their own flowers, they have to get pollen from another tree. This is why with a lot of uh, uh, fruit crops, you plant more than one tree because you want cross pollination and you get a better, uh, you get a successful seed uh, set or a more numerous seed set if you have more than one plant around. Right. Okay, so we have a final question from your friend, Richard Morud. And I would like a light stab at this question first. It's a little, a little bit of a hardball here. He goes, question, should our native plant society pursue efforts towards purchase and protection of all remaining natural areas in Florida? That would be great if we could. Yeah. But, but what we do need to do is to kill these uh crazy ideas to build a nice big super highway through the green space because it's uh, got fewer towns in the way. So let's run a highway through there. We already have a pretty good interstate system. So why run one up through the uh, west part of the peninsula through all that beautiful green space? I think we ought to preserve what we have uh, maybe we can't purchase it all, but we can keep it from being developed. Like right now, there's, it's dead for now, but it was a, an issue a couple of years ago, and it was an issue now when it's dead again, but they want to build a, a gasoline station right on the corner uh, by uh, what we call the springs, you know, and uh, it sits right on top of the cave, you know, and it can destroy one of the best freshwater springs in the United States by a gasoline leakage. Uh, that's not the best place to put a gasoline station. So we need to protect the sites we have. We can't purchase them all, but we can argue against uh, adverse developments in them, like putting a highway through a beautiful forest or uh, drilling for oil. They drilled for oil over in Calhoun County, then they were all dry, so they decided to pull out. But they, county commissioners, uh, saw the dollar sign and gave them permission to drill. And they drilled very close to the Apalachicola River, which could have been a catastrophic accident in the making if uh, they'd had some successes and some spillage. It could have ruined the the seafood industry in the Apalachicola Bay. Uh, so we need to protect what we have. We can't purchase it all. We don't have enough money, but we should protect what we have from adverse development. Right, so we need to talk money a little bit here, yeah. right? So, so we, need to, we need to educate the citizens of Florida that tourism's a big dollar industry. And part of that tourism is the beautiful green state we have. And if we uh, get rid of all the flowers, we can't call it Florida anymore. Uh, so we need to uh, protect what we have. Yes, yeah, so you don't really get a chance to rest on your laurels in conservation because everything, you, even once it's protected, you still have to right. battle off, you know, future um, people attempting to attempting to develop. Right. And so, you know, when, I mean, I really appreciate it's sort of like a major compliment to the Native Plant Society thinking that we have enough power and money to, you know, protect remaining 
natural lands. Anyone listening has a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. I know. Preserve plants. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, there's so much. I mean, I think that's a really important. I, because I mean, I just think about what we have lost just, you know, in the last 50, 60 years. It's been and, a whole lot. When you come right down to it, preserving the plant systems is what preserves the animals as well. If you want, including us, if you want the Florida panther to survive, you got to have the green space that it uses as its roaming space. Uh, and you've got to have clean waters for the manatee and the vegetation in those waters that the manatees eat if you want manatees. So if you're an animal lover, you need to protect the plants because it's all part of the ecosystem. The plants are really there at the root of it. And functioning ecosystems <laughs> provide us with all sorts of, you know, ecosystem services that we all yeah. depend on for, right. for to live, so. Like buffering extreme weather, such as you know massive hurricanes that we're increasingly having. Well, there was a study I think it was in the National Geographic that in some of the bigger communities, the rich people have a lot of trees in their yard, and the poor people don't, and so the poor people suffer from heat more than the rich people do in the same community. Uh, we need to be aware of how important uh, the green space is, preserve what we have, maybe even expand it, maybe we need fewer lawns and more native plants in our yards. Of course, if you let your yard go native, all the neighbors get upset, upset because it doesn't look like their yard. <laughs> but, uh, uh. Right. So in addition to, you know, a policy of protecting existing conservation lands, we have several other, you know, good policies because we don't have the money. That's the thing. Even if FNPS doubled its budget next year, tripled 10 times our budget, we cannot possibly replace even the, the drastically underfunded Florida Forever program. It doesn't well, I mean you could we could yeah. have a few thirty thousand dollar donations. We still couldn't do it. Well, preservation is so inexpensive compared to restoration. You know, the Corps of Engineers uh, straightened out the Kissimmee River, you know, years ago, and now they want to return it to its wild form, and it's going to cost them a factor of uh, tens or hundreds of dollars more uh, than what the original work was so restoration is expensive so preservation is the way to go yep. we've got we've got some kudos in the chat um people are really excited about this program so we'd like to have to you back on sometime dr anderson yeah <laughs> yeah we could pick a topic. I mean, I think some of your plant anatomy talks that you've given are really excellent. And that I would love to get him on a lunch and learn. Oh, yeah. but, well, another whole area of interest is forensic botany using plants in, uh, in the courtroom. Mm -hmm. And I've had some experience with that because of my interest in cannabis, but not just cannabis, but other plants as well. I've had some interesting uh, courtroom experiences mm -hmm. yeah. yeah well we will get you back over here <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, all, right. all right sounds awesome so thank you so thank much you dr so anderson much for coming today dr anderson yeah. and and um thank you for everyone who attended and and we will get him back thank you yes fun to be here yes and uh i hope you guys have a good night and i hope everybody out there has an excellent night Buy a license plate voucher. Oh, Thank yep. <laughs> we need some of those funds for co conservation. Right? You know, save the land. Help us out.